Thanks for the introduction, Janice, and thank you all for attending today's presentation on sequencing considerations for low diversity samples. We felt this webinar is particularly important because the cluster density and base diversity are two main factors that impact sequencing run performance with respect to both data quality and data yield. In today's webinar, we'll be discussing the following topics. What is nucleotide diversity? How to determine base diversity of your library? How can low base diversity impact instrument calculations? And finally, we'll be providing strategies and best practices to optimize low diversity sequencing runs to get the best performance with those libraries. To start, let's briefly cover what we mean when we say nucleotide diversity. Nucleotide diversity is the proportion of each nucleotide, A, T, C, and G, at each position in a sequencing library. A library is balanced or diverse when we have roughly equal proportions, approximately 25%, of each nucleotide in a given cycle. Later, we'll discuss why that's important for the run performance, data quality, and data yield. So why does base diversity differ among different libraries? This is typically related to the desired application and corresponding library preparation. Samples derived from randomly fragmented whole genome samples are a great example of base or a great example of diverse and balanced libraries. Because the library is derived from the entire genome, the fragments will have a nucleotide diversity that is representative of the overall genome-wide nucleotide diversity or the organism. On the right, we're looking at a sample of sequences from four different clusters, and we can see that the samples or we can see that they each have an equal representation of each base in the cycle as indicated by the black box. As each cycle will have a similarly proportionate balance of nucleotide diversity throughout the sequencing run, this library is said to be both diverse and balanced. Other examples of diverse libraries can include exome capture libraries or many DNA-seq or RNA-seq libraries. Now let's take a look at low diversity libraries. Low diversity samples are typically derived from a specific subset of the genome, often through PCR amplification of specific regions of interest. This means that many of our clusters will derive from fragments with the same or highly similar sequences. In the example to the right, we can see that the sequences are identical, so the diversity per cycle is very low. Common examples of low diversity libraries include 16S metagenomics libraries or targeted libraries. If you'd like more information on preparing and sequencing Amplicon libraries, we have a really great recorded webinar linked below. Finally, let's take a look at an example of an unbalanced library. Unbalanced libraries will have a disproportionate nucleotide representation, often due to how the libraries are treated during preparation. For example, bisulfite sequencing can be used to determine methylation patterns in DNA samples and is a common sequencing application that will have an unbalanced library. One of the many ways that cells will try to regulate transcription is through the addition of methyl groups to cytosine residues within regulatory regions of the genome. During library preparation, bisulfite treatment will convert unmethylated cytosines to uracil, which are then converted to thymine during PCR amplification. The result is a library that has a high proportion of T calls with a low proportion of C calls, and this results in an unbalanced library. In the example on the right, we can see that this sampling of sequences from four clusters we have a higher than expected number of thymine bases and no cytosine present, leading to an unbalanced signal. Next, let's dive into how to tell what our library base diversity is using metrics collected during the sequencing run. To determine the library diversity from sequencing run metrics, we would recommend using the data by cycle chart 
under the Analysis tab in Sequencing Analysis Viewer, or SAV, or the Charts tab of Base Based Sequencing Hub. Under this chart, we can use the drop down menu, highlighted there in blue, to select Percent Base and then review the proportion of each base call at each cycle. If you'd like to know more about how to use SAV to review run metrics and sequencing run performance, we have the following recorded webinar on our support website as well. When we select the percent base metric in our data by cycle chart, it will show the proportion of each nucleotide per cycle throughout the sequencing run. When viewing the percent base plots in the data by cycle chart, we have the cycle number along the x-axis at the bottom with the percent base along the y-axis with individual lines for each base. In this slide, we have representative percent base charts for three different examples of diverse and well-balanced libraries, such as PhiX, whole genome samples, and an RNA-seq library. In all of these libraries, we can see that each nucleotide is present in roughly the same proportion, all around 25%. Here, we have two examples of libraries that are either low diversity or unbalanced. On the left, we have a representative sample for a 16S metagenomics library, which will typically have a low base diversity. We can see that in any given cycle, the majority of the signal is from a single nucleotide. In the chart to the right, we're looking at a methylated, unbalanced methyl seq library, where we are seeing a low proportion of C calls and a high proportion of T calls in the forward read. After paired end turnaround, we are reading the complement of these sequences, so we'll now see low G calls and high A calls. Now that we have an idea of what nucleotide diversity is and how we can review it using sequencing run metrics, let's take a closer look at how nucleotide diversity actually impacts sequencing run performance on Illumina instruments. During the sequencing run, the instrument will collect data from each of the clusters and use this data to perform a variety of calculations, including template generation, matrix correction, phasing and prephasing correction, clusters passing filter, and the quality score. Before we dive deeper into each different metric, let's briefly discuss the difference between pattern and non-pattern flow cells. For non-pattern flow cells, such as those in use on the NextSeq 500 and 550, MiniSeq, MySeq, and the HiSeq 2500 instruments, the clusters will be randomly distributed across the flow cell surface. Because the clusters are generated randomly, the instrument does not know where the clusters will be located and will use the first few cycles of the sequencing run to map the, cluster, uh, excuse me, the location of the clusters. This process is called template generation. Template generation is very similar to mapping stars and actually uses an algorithm similar to those used to generate star charts in astronomy. For systems that use pattern flow cells, such as our HiSeq X, HiSeq 3000 and 4000, NovaSeq, iSeq, and the NextSeq 2000 system, the clusters will form in nano wells that are manufactured onto the flow cell. With a pattern flow cell, registration markers called ring fiducials are used to align a predetermined map of the ordered nanowells. On a pattern flow cell, template generation is therefore not needed. Instead, the instrument uses the first few cycles to identify wells that have clusters and which wells are empty. Let's talk about how library diversity impacts template generation. Since low diversity libraries will have a stronger impact on template generation in non-pattern flow cells, we will focus on non-pattern flow cells for this section. Pictures of clusters are captured from the flow cell over the first four to seven cycles, depending on the sequencing platform. The instrument will then identify clusters that have a unique sequence of signals among cycles. 
Even if two clusters are very close together, the instrument can differentiate between them because each cluster will have a unique sequence. In each cycle, the signal from the clusters are recorded and used to generate the template map that reflects the physical location of each cluster on the flow cell. Once this template map has been generated, it's used throughout the sequencing run. Because template generation uses the unique series of base calls during the first few cycles, template generation is most efficient when we have high diversity libraries. For example, when sequencing our PHIX control, each cluster will provide a unique sequence so we can accurately identify and map each cluster when they're very close together. Here, the instrument was able to successfully map each of the 12 clusters. Now let's consider a low diversity library in which the clusters all contain very similar sequences during template generation. Clusters that are spaced apart from other clusters are easily identified as separate clusters. However, clusters that are closely adjacent to each other will show the same sequence and sometimes the instrument will map these groups as a single cluster. In the above example, three groups of adjacent clusters are each mapped as single clusters. So despite there being 12 clusters in this field of view, the template map will only register eight clusters in total. This impacts sequencing yield by reducing the raw number of clusters that are mapped and can also impact the number of clusters passing filter and quality scores. The next calculation that could be affected with low diversity libraries is matrix correction. Matrix correction is the process of mathematically adjusting the signal intensity intensities for each cluster. During the imaging step in sequencing by synthesis, SBS, the Illumina instrument is using either four channel, two channel, or one channel sequencing depending on the instrument. The MySeq and all HiSeq platforms will use four channel chemistry. In four channel chemistry, each nucleotide has a different fluorophore attached. Each base has a unique fluorescent emission wavelength, and four-channel chemistry uses one image per base. The NextSeq, MiniSeq, and NovaSeq instruments will use two-channel chemistry, which uses only two images per cycle. The image from the red channel and one image from the green channel. The base calls are made from a combination of the red and green channels. T is called for 100% red intensity, T for 100% green intensity, A for 50% green and 50% red, and G is called when no intensity is measured. Please note that the NextSeq 1000 and 2000 systems use two-channel chemistry similar to the NextSeq 500 and 550 and the NovaSeq. However, Instead of using red and green channels, it utilizes blue and green. Using the blue instead of red allows for greater resolution with closely packed nanowells. C is 100% blue channel intensity, T is 100% green channel intensity, A is 50% blue and 50% green, and G is still when no signal intensity, intensity is measured. The iSeq 100 uses one channel chemistry sequencing, where the instrument uses a single imaging channel, two images, and a chemistry step in between. A base call is made on the combination of the two images. For example, A is present in image one, but not in image two. C is not present in image one, but is in image two. T is present in both images, and G is not present in either image. If you want to know more about the iSeq, check out our recorded webinar, iSeq 100, an introduction. Now that we've reviewed the different chemistry types, let's take a closer look at intensity corrections and how that re relates to base diversity of the library. For this presentation, we'll focus on four-channel chemistry 
but the concepts are similar for two channel and one channel. Because the fluorophores emit signal at different peak intensities, the intensities have to be normalized. Normalization is necessary to avoid overcalling of bases that have higher peak intensity. We also have to account for crosstalk between emission spectra. Crosstalk is the overlap between emission spectra. For example, on the high seq systems, G and T both emit fluorescent signal when excited by the green laser. Therefore, when reading the signal from the T channel, a small amount of overlap from the G channel will be measured due to the signal overlap. Effective matrix corrections will help account for this. Correction prevents the strongest fluorophore from being overcalled and purifies the signal for better base calling. Once these corrections are performed, we can see that the intensity plots are now equalized across all four channels. Because the matrix correction calculations are empirically determined during the early cycles of the sequencing run, they are most effective when signal for all four bases is available, such as in well-balanced libraries. If library diversity is low, these matrix calculations may not be balanced, which can result in a skewed matrix correction. In the next section, we're going to take a look at phasing and prephasing correction, which is a measure of how accurate the SBS chemistry is occurring. So what do we mean by phasing and prephasing? During the sequencing by synthesis reaction, each DNA strand in a cluster is extended by one base per cycle. Phasing occurs when a base fails to incorporate during a cycle and the strand falls behind. Prephasing occurs when more than one base is incorporated during a cycle and the strand jumps ahead. During the sequencing run, the instrument will use the fluorescent signals from each channel for each cluster to estimate the percentage of strands that are either phasing or prephasing, with a typical run showing values of less than 0.4%. However, these calculations are based on balanced and diverse libraries such as PhiX. Unbalanced or low diversity libraries may skew these calculations, leading to an inaccurate estimation of phasing and or prephasing values. This could present as higher than expected bit levels of phasing, prephasing, or both. In the next section, we're going to talk about clusters passing filter which is a measure for cluster quality. Instrument software filters clusters by signal purity with pure clusters said to be passing filter. This filter is a measure of the difference between the two highest signals in the cluster. This test is applied to each cluster during the first 25 cycles of the sequencing run. In this first example, taken from a four-channel chemistry run, we can observe that the C channel is significantly higher than the next highest signal in the A channel, so the cluster is said to be passing filter. In the second example, none of the channels are producing strong signal, so the difference between the top two signals is very small, and the cluster does not pass filter. In this example, the instrument is looking at background or a cluster that is not producing signal anymore. In this third example, the instrument has identified a polyclonal cluster where the cluster is showing strong signal from two different channels, and the difference between the two channels is not sufficient enough to make a high confidence base call for this cycle. Importantly, MAP clusters that fail to pass filter twice in the first 25 cycles will not be included in the remainder of the sequencing run. To illustrate how low diversity sequences can impact clusters passing filter, suppose clusters one and two of a low diversity library were in close proximity to one another on the flow cell. Because the library has a low diversity, 
The clusters will have the same sequence for the first six cycles and will likely be mapped as one cluster during template generation. When the sequences of these two clusters diverges in cycle seven, the instrument will interpret the signal from two clusters as impure and the cluster will not pass filter. The cluster will then be excluded from the sequencing run. In the next section, we're going to talk about how the quality score and how low diversity libraries can affect those calculations. We define our quality scores as the probability of an error in the base call. Please note this, that this is not a measure of the absolute accuracy of the base call, but rather an estimate of the confidence that the instrument has that each base call is accurate. A base call with a quality score of 30 has a probability of 1 in 1,000 of making an incorrect base call. So the higher the quality score, the higher the confidence in the accuracy of this base call. Again, if template generation, matrix correction, phasing and prephasing estimates, and quality filtering calculations are accurate, this will yield a high quality base score as the instrument will have a high confidence in the accuracy of the base calls. For low diversity libraries, each metric that is used for the Q-score calculation can be impacted, which can lead to a lower overall Q-score. Let's pause here for a quick review of how low diversity libraries can impact the instrument sequencing calculations. First, when, being sequenced, or when sequencing low diversity libraries, few clusters are typically being generated and mapped resulting in a lower overall yield. Because we may not have signal from all bases present at the time of matrix generation, low diversity libraries can result in a skewed matrix calculation. Phasing, prephasing, or both may be elevated. Library, low diversity libraries can see percent pass filter, again, reduced, resulting in a lower overall yield. Lastly, we may see the lower quality scores as a result of the impact of low diversity libraries on the above calculations. So now that we understand what nucleotide diversity is, how to determine the base diversity of our libraries using run metrics, and how base diversity impacts instrument sequencing run performance, let's take a look at how we can optimize our sequencing runs to handle low diversity libraries. We have four main strategies that we can use to improve low diversity sequencing data. We'll do a deeper dive into each of these, but overall, we recommend spiking in a balanced and diverse library, reducing the cluster density, careful library design, and proper library preparation quality control. Our first strategy is to spike in a well balanced library, such as PhiX or another whole genome sample. We recommend PhiX because it's a well-defined, diverse genome whose small size makes it easy for our software to perform an alignment on the fly during a sequencing run. The Illumina PhiX library is also unindexed and therefore will not be included in demultiplexed FASTQ files, which allows us to spike in this control library without having to adjust our library pooling design. Finally, because we are able to align the sequences to the known PhiX genome, we can empirically measure the error rate for each cycle, which will provide information on how accurate the sequencing run is performing at each cycle. The key to an effective use of PhiX is that we need to meet the following percent align recommendations for low diversity libraries. On the iSeq 100, this is going to be a minimum of 5% the MiniSeq 10 to 50%, MySeq MCS 2.2 or greater is a minimum of 5%, the NextSeq 500 and 550 is 10 to 50%, similar to that of the NextSeq 1000 and 2000, the HiSeq 1000, 1500, 2000, and 2500 with HiSeq control software 2.2.38 or greater should see a minimum of 5%, 
the HiSeq 3000 and 4000 with HiSeq control software 3.3.76 or lower should have 10 to 50% and 3.40 or higher 5 to 20%. And on the NovaSeq, we recommend a minimum of 5%. Because of differences in how efficient the library clusters are compared to the PhiX library, or excuse me, because of differences in how efficient the library clusters compared to PhiX, there may not always be a perfect one-to-one -one relationship between the percent aligned metric and the amount of PhiX spiked into our library pool. One of the strongest factors driving this is library size. So if the library being ran is smaller than PhiX, it will cluster more efficiently and we should consider increasing the PhiX spike-in, while larger libraries might require less PhiX. Therefore, these recommendations should be seen as starting values for the PhiX spike-in, and the actual spike-in amount will need to be empirically determined based off of your libraries. To illustrate how PhiX can help balance base diversity, we can go back to our example of M&Ms. If we have a bowl of all green M&Ms, it's difficult to distinguish each candy from one another. However, it makes it much easier to find the green M&Ms when all colors are equally balanced since we can now focus on the borders of each individual candy. As a final note, while there is no need to worry about providing a balanced signal with high diversity libraries, Illumina does recommend spiking in a minimum of 1% PhiX as a positive sequencing control which will allow us to calculate the PhiX error rate, which can be very useful if we need to troubleshoot a sequencing run. As we discussed, our recommendations are based on the amount of PhiX that is actually aligning to the PhiX reference genome, rather than to the amount of PhiX that is spiked into the libraries. To determine the actual amount of PhiX that is being identified in the sequencing run, we check the percent align metric in the summary tab on sequencing analysis viewer or the charts tab in base space sequencing hub. If we are not meeting the recommended minimum amount of PhiX aligned, we can increase the PhiX spike in for future sequencing runs with similar libraries. Our second strategy to improve low diversity sequencing data is to reduce the cluster density. It's important to note that our cluster density recommendations for different sequencing platforms and chemistry versions assume that the library is diverse and well-balanced. In addition to spiking in a high-diversity library, we recommend reducing the template or library input when running an unbalanced or low-diversity library. Though the amount of, excuse me, though the amount of reduction required must be empirically determined for your libraries. As best practice, you should target about 20 to 30% lower cluster density than are recommended densities if running a low diversity library or an unbalanced library. For example, when running low diversity libraries on a MySeq, we recommend a starting density of approximately 800 to 900 K per millimeter squared. As a note, we also do not want our density to go under around 600 K per millimeter squared as under-clustering can have negative impacts on low diversity sequencing quality as well. As shown in these examples, the thumbnail on the left is our, at our recommended cluster density of approximately 1200 K per millimeter squared, while the thumbnail image on the right is at a reduced cluster density of approximately 850 K per millimeter squared. In the right image, we have better cluster separation and clearer background signal. Going back to our M&M example, spreading out those M&Ms will also help us focus on each M&M individually rather than as a group. Our third strategy is careful library design. If possible, it's important to introduce base diversity into the first 25 cycles when designing custom libraries and to maintain that diversity throughout the sequencing run. If we are designing custom libraries that have a low diversity region or use an internal universal molecular identifier, a UMI, we will want to try to avoid significant changes in base diversity after cycle 25 as quality scores will sometimes decline. 
This may sound counterintuitive as we might expect a shift from low diversity to high diversity to improve our quality scores. However, we often do not observe this decline in quality scores due to the fact that the template map and matrix phasing, pre-phasing calculations are based on empirical measurements for the first 25 cycles, and our quality scores are prediction of how accurate those base calls are, excuse me, One moment. Our quality scores are prediction of how accurately those base calls are based on how well this data fits the empirical model. Therefore, significant changes to the base diversity can cause the data to fit this empirical model poorly and reduce confidence in the base call. To lessen the impact of these changes in base diversity and associated decline in quality scores, we can spike in a diverse library such as PhiX or another whole genome library. The final strategy we provide is proper library preparation quality control. Insufficient library cleanup steps can lead to the presence of library preparation contaminants such as adapter dimers, primer dimers, or partial library constructs that can greatly impact library quantification and clustering efficiency. We recommend that you verify all libraries for quality and purity using the Fragment Analyzer or BioAnalyzer to check for library integrity, average insert size, and the presence of contamination. As shown in this example, when we're sequencing libraries with a high percentage of adapter dimers where no insert is present, the percent base chart will show low diversity sequences followed by a characteristic single base overcall as the cluster stops producing signal. These characteristic base calls are high percent A base for the MySeq or HiSeq platforms because A is the lowest intensity base call for four channel chemistry. High percent G base call for the MiniSeq, NextSeq, and NovaSeq platforms because no intensity will default to a G base. Or a high percent G or percent T calls for the iSeq 100 system because neither of these signals will change between image one and image two. Each of these phenotypes indicates the instrument is sequencing through the adapter and into the flow cell, and the cluster has stopped pr producing signal associated with the next base incorporation. In summary, remember when designing and performing low diversity sequencing, that the lack of base diversity can impact the ability of the sequencer to accurately identify, normalize, correct, and process the data. To achieve high quality data for low diversity samples, we recommend spiking in the appropriate amount of PhiX or other balanced library, and to run low diversity libraries at 20 to 30% below the recommended cluster densities for diverse libraries. Please use this table as a reference when you're choosing your sequencing platform and chemistry version for your low diversity libraries. Finally, we have a wealth of resources for Amplicon and low diversity library sequencing. So we'll leave you with links for technical notes, application notes, support bulletins, and online courses. As I mentioned to you at the beginning of the presentation, both cluster density and base diversity have the greatest impact on run performance, so we would highly encourage you to all take a look at our recently published Cluster Optimization Overview Guide, which has a lot of great information on which metrics to look at when optimizing cluster density for sequencing runs on Illumina platforms. We also have a useful bulletin listing the cluster density guidelines for all our different platforms. Additionally, I wanted to share a few more bulletins that I felt were really pertinent to this conversation and provide a link to our Sequencing Analysis Viewer program, which can be downloaded and installed on any Windows operating system. For more information about anything and everything Illumina, please feel free to click on the following links and browse for additional resources. Additionally, we have recently updated the Kit Selector tool and our custom protocol selector both of which are more user-friendly. 
We've also updated the online courses page so we can use the training video filter or type to filter any recorded or upcoming webinars or training videos. Well, thanks so much for your time today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat now.